Right, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is, I'm afraid, not directly about self-build, but it is quite important because it's the start of the process that will help to drill down the opportunity for development of individual sites in the future. So um, my name's Sarah O'Driscoll. I'm the service manager for strategic city planning, which is a very boring title, which means that I'm responsible for those policy documents that um, set out how the future of the city will grow, so how we will see new development happen in Bristol. Um, we're in a very interesting position at the moment. We've got a full set of planning documents. So we have all those documents that set out the policies for growth, where growth happens and how it should happen. But we need to start rolling those forward right across the west of England and think about housing numbers up to 2036. So this is a really quite a, quite a big task, as you might imagine. So we're leading a process right across the west of England of consulting on the future for, for um, the west of England for housing and for jobs. So... The way we're doing this um, is looking at those four unitary authorities. So those are the four authorities that those of you who have been around for some time will remember made up Avon. So that was Avon County Council. But we now call it the West of England. And it's the four unitary authorities of Bristol, Bath and North East Somerset, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. So they are, they're a kind of an effective area because they're an area that works together quite, quite coherently in terms of economy. So the, the businesses across this area recognise that as a, a business area. It's an area where people travel to work um, and work and live within and it's an area which we, we pro probably all travel around quite consistently so we, we know the, the spread and, and the, the character and the nature of the area. So the four unit authorities, authorities are looking together to, to make the future of our, our city and our area effective and, and make sure that we've got the homes and the jobs for our children and our children's children up to 2036 and beyond. So, a bit of a task. So, during that period, what do we need? We need a lot of housing. We need a lot of affordable housing. Um, we need to be able to make sure that we're providing the housing for the future without making the, uh, the congestion and the air quality worse, so that we have a sustainable and coherent future on that front, that we've got the right kind of transport infrastructure, um, that we keep in place that really high quality environment that we've got in the west of England that we all value so much. And that's not just in the outer parts of the west of England area, around the, the outer edges and towards the, the estuary and the coast, but also in the inner in the parts of Bristol. So in, within our inner areas, our green spaces are very important within our urban area as well. So recognising the importance of our quality throughout. So we want a, a sustainable future, and that has to be right across the board, so both environmental and social and economic, so it's not a one-strand issue. Um, so we're, the reason we're looking across the four authorities at this point in time is that we all have strategic plans that set out the housing numbers we need to deliver up to 2026. If we're going to do this sensibly, we need to think about how that growth has to happen across our borders, across the four unitary authorities. And we have to do that together um, and under something that's called in legal terms the duty to cooperate. So we need to work together. So we want to look at all those cross-boundary issues and make sure that we're considering properly how the area will grow and how affordable housing will be provided, particularly right across the area. So we're starting this big journey and we've done a very uh, significant piece of work called um, a, a strategic housing market assessment across um, particularly Bristol, North Somerset and um, South Gloucestershire and looked at the, afford the amount of homes we need in that area up to 2036. And the sort of staggering number is that we need about 85,000 new homes, including affordable homes, up to 2036. So the, the kind of the, the tell on that is quite significant. So it is, it is a big number. Um, and the, the overall number that comes out of the, this piece of work called the, um, uh, the housing market assessment is that we need 85,000 new homes altogether and that we have already found sites for or allowed for about 56,000 new homes up to 2026. So for the, for the remaining that we haven't yet found sites for, it's about 29,000. So we need to find sites and places to build 29,000 new homes that we haven't yet identified. So that, that's quite a large number. 
Um, and of those 29,000 homes, about 17,900 need to be affordable housing. So that's, that gives an indication of how significant our affordable housing need is right across the west of England. It's not just in Bristol, it is right across the west of England. And I'm sorry, because Jackson asked me to do this in 10 minutes, I'm not giving you much time to absorb these numbers, but I'm, I'm sure Jackson will make them available on, on a website somewhere later. Um, we can have a conversation afterwards. But it, it kind of looks like that. So the picture to bear in your mind is that we have found sites for around 56,000 new homes, or we can forecast where they will come. We need to find, and we think we can find, about 12,000 within the urban fabric of those major centres within the west of England. So within Bristol, and particularly within Bristol and Western Supermare, we think we can probably find sites for around an extra 12,000 homes. So the pressure that that leaves on finding sites outside of the existing urban fabric is, is um, the greenfield area factor, which is around about the size of three Nailses or two Clevedons. Now that's a bit of a... That's a bit of a big thought, isn't it? So that we're still looking for quite a significant amount of land that we haven't already identified. So we're on a, a bit of a journey in Bristol, as you might imagine, to identify those brownfield sites and to get them away. So we need to support all that growth and we need to make sure that the growth we have is a growth that's supported by infrastructure. So there's no, no good us looking for sites and saying um, we can find lots of sites, we can spot a number of redundant roundabouts, we could put a significant number of tower blocks on those redundant roundabouts, but then where do you put the schools and how do you, how do you cope with the health requirements of those communities? So all of this work needs to be rolled up right across um, along with the improving the local infrastructure process. We also need to make sure that we don't bite into that very good quality land without clear justification. So the land, particularly in the green belt, you can, we can look at lots of pretty pictures. What this, I like this one as well. This is a pretty picture to me because I'm a geographer, really. So um, that is a, a really good map of all the West of England environmental assets. So, so wrapped up in, in pictures like that is the kind of mapped detail that sets out all the special protection areas, uh, the ancient woodlands, the priority habitat, um, interesting things like registered battlefields, so that kind of mustard colour is a registered battlefield. I'm not entirely sure where that is, but there must be one in there somewhere. The blue isn't actually flood risk, so on this, this map doesn't identify areas at risk of floods. That's another interesting environmental constraint that you might have to add to that map. The blue is actually agricultural land of really high quality, so that's the high quality agricultural land that we'd need to protect. So when we're looking at new sites, to, to find outside of Bristol the extra bit of land that we're not going to be able to find within the urban capacity and within Western Supermare. These are all the other factors that we're going to have to take into account. So um, the, uh, the, pr the pressure really is that we get our new, sing new housing as far as possible on developed land and we make the best use of our urban sites as we bring that forward. So and this is perhaps where some of the challenge on you as people who are interested in, in self-build comes. It's helping us to, to identify and, and work through sites that can be delivered for, for a whole range of, of new housing forms and types. Um, we want to minimise the need to develop our green space, both within the city, as I've said, and outside. Um, one of the constraints that we have, or one of the factors that we have through this process, is our existing green belt, which many of you will be available of, are aware of. I always find this quite a, a surprise, really, because I suppose we tend to look in Bristol. We'll look at Bristol's map and we'll see the, the green belt around Bristol. It goes a long way beyond Bristol. So if you look at the extent of green belt right around the city, you can see how challenging it's going to be to find new land to, to grow our, our communities on outside of Bristol without having some form of impact on the green belt. So that's another challenge that we're trying to take into account with this process. So we've got a, um, a bit of a consultation going on. It began on the 9th of November and it goes on till the 29th of January. So a longer period than than is usual for these kinds of planning consultations to reflect the fact that it's a really big issue and that it's going across a lot of, uh, a lot of um, the, the sub-area. We had a launch meeting last Friday and we've had a number of events in Bristol this week. We've had one at the, uh, the, at the, um, the main library just by, the, uh, by City Hall and we've had one up in Lockleys yesterday. There are a number of other um, locations within Bristol but also within North Somerset and Bath and North East Somerset 
out in South Gloucestershire where um, we're rolling out exhibitions and, uh, and uh, events a little bit like this where we're having an opportunity to speak. And these are really the main, the main questions that we're asking. So this is, a bit of, this is a bit of a sales pitch, really, for me, is to ask you to take away in your head these questions. And perhaps I'll give you the details at the end of, uh, of the consultation site and go into that and consider the questions in more detail and feed back your high-level strategic thoughts, but by, by all means also your thoughts of how that drills down into your future requirements around self-build. So... Having the very big challenge, where do we go to, to find the new housing? The, this is a map of all the strategic locations that we could go to, so you'll note that disclaimer. So everyone who's, who puts up these slides is required to put this disclaimer out there and repeat it loudly. Location symbols are indicative only and will not be taken to imply any specific development site or a preference for identified options. So if you happen to live in a village that's underneath one of those symbols, don't panic yet. This, this is very much a very high-level strategic indicative approach. So there are a number of ways in which we might find to grow our capacity over the next uh, 20 plus years. We are presuming that we will look for urban intensification, so all of these maps I'm going to show you have that presumption in place that we will be looking for that uh, 10 to 12,000 new homes within the grey area out of Bristol and Western Supermare. But going beyond that, we have options to think about urban extensions. So if you look at those little um, forward backward arrows, we are showing a number of potential urban extensions around Bristol. And these have all been considered in the past. I have to say, they're not fresh ideas, so they've all been, they've all been put forward. They would all include some biting into the green belt, so there's some challenge with that. So we'd, we'd like some feedback on that thought. Um, there are potentials for town expansions around locations like Portishead, Clevedon and Nailsey. Um, there are also opportunities for growth at other smaller locations. So those are the green, uh, the green marks. Um, Temple Cloud, quite a small location. Saltford, these are the smaller places. All of those areas have some capacity for growth. Um, it would need to be growth that came forward with the um, accompanying um, infrastructure requirements. Otherwise, it would put pressure on those communities. That's part of the big bundle. So there are five alternative scenarios, the first of which is protecting the green belt, in which case you'd see the urban intensification in Bristol, Western Supermare, but then all the growth being pushed out beyond the green belt. Um, concentrating all the growth within the Bristol urban area, so you can see that focuses on, the, on urban extensions and the um, urban concentration work. Um, looking at a transport focused growth. So this is looking at where are the opportunities to maximize community and settlement growth, which takes advantage of existing transport linkages and maybe enables some growth in transport infrastructure. That doesn't mean more cars. That may mean better rail links or better bus and public transport links. It doesn't mean that we build new roads in principle. So there, there are a number of options around, around that. There are two other options which aren't mapped. One which is effectively saying, well, we put a little bit of growth everywhere. So all the villages out in North Somerset and uh, Baines and up in South Gloucestershire, we get a little bit of growth. Everyone would take a bit of the hit. Or we look and consider the potential of a new settlement. So effectively centering on one existing small town or small location and building that up so it becomes a new town in that rather Milton Keynes type new town approach. So a very a different type of solution. It's a theoretical solution. It isn't one that we as planning officers so far have identified a, a location for. But I'm... I'm would anticipate that there will be, through our consultation, there'll be those developers and landowners out there who may well want to suggest that's an effective solution and we might want to work that through. Um, having mentioned the importance of transport, we're co-running a consultation on the, on the joint transport study at the moment, so that's going on at the same time so that we can integrate the potential for improved transport and infrastructure through the work that we're doing with our, our joint spatial plan work, so that's going on at the same time. And the timetable for this is we're up at the top there with the issues and options, which goes on to the end of January. Um, this is the, the 
distressing thing, I suppose, for most people is that it's a very long journey. So we wouldn't get to a place where we had an adopted joint spatial plan until 2018. Um, when we say adopted, what that means is it's been through a whole range of statutory processes, including being examined by an inspector, which gives us a firm number for new homes and jobs to be provided into the future and says in general terms where those strategic locations should be. So it's a long journey, but it's, uh, but it's one that when you get there, it gives you the confidence that you can then protect all other locations outside of those strategic locations from major growth. So it kind of deals with the major house builders and it helps them to direct their energies to places where you know it's going to be acceptable rather than having development from planning applications into the green belt, which we can't resist because we can't show where their development would go otherwise. So it is a quite an important process. So the, um, there's a website which, um, if you drill into, um, invites you to have a specific set of, um, respond to a specific set of questions which you can do online. Um, and to log in and register both for the transport study and for the joint spatial plan issues and options process. And there's the, there's the website address. Um, I've got a number of uh, leaflets and cards which I'll, I'll leave at the end which you can take away if you're interested in going and working into this consultation with us. We'd be very pleased to have your comments. Um, what I did just put up there um, is the self-build register, just so that if you haven't, you may have seen this slide already, Jackson, have you already had this one up at some point? No. So there's, there's the self-build register. So you can get into that um, from, um, and I think I got to this one, I think probably from your website, Jackson, which people, probably people will see. So you can, you can go from um, Jackson's website into this and then that will register you. The importance of that is that as we're moving forward, we are, we're um, working through a process of identifying the, um, the number of people who are interested in self-build and then we expect to be required by what's currently the housing and planning bill to identify the number of uh, sites that would be needed to satisfy the demand that's shown by the self-build register and other survey work. So it will be important into the future that we have a clear record through this site and through other survey work of the level of need because if we're going to move to identify a specific number of self-build sites, we need to be sure that they're going to come forward and be used up because we had the interesting conversation from Maria earlier around um, time-limited permissions, in effect, for self-build. So you had to deliver it within two years. We don't want to find that we've got sites that we've set aside for self-build that could have been built for by housing associations. So there's a, an important interrelationship we're going to have to work through. We're not clear yet how that's going to be required because we haven't yet got the regulations from central government that will specify that. But things tend to move quite quickly these days, so in the years gone past, it might take a year from the end of an act to get regulations. They seem to come much more swiftly than that these days, so I would anticipate you know, we could well be in a place where we have regulations even by the, you know, the middle of the spring, so it could be quite a dynamic process. So I think that's my... Oh, did I have one more? No, yes, that's another end slide. So no, that is it. So that's... Jackson, I'm sorry, that's as fast as I could possibly have done it. I, expe I expect I've gabbled. So I'm really sorry. <laughs>